I'm Tracy Sable tonight on EWTN News Nightly. Race for the White House. Former President Donald Trump is back in a New York courtroom while President Joe Biden hits the campaign trail. Religious motive. New developments in the stabbing of an Orthodox bishop and priest in Australia. Rising tension. Iran issues a threat to Israel amid fears of a widening conflict in the Middle East. And she's the one. Learn more about the graduate of a Catholic high school in Iowa who is the top pick in the WNBA draft. These stories and more tonight. From EWTN, the Global Catholic Network, this is EWTN News Nightly. Thank you for being with us on the Feast of St. Bernadette. Our top story tonight, it is day two of former President Trump's hush money trial. Jury selection was moving at a snail's pace so far. Attorneys have dismissed dozens of potential jurors and chose six. Candidates are being questioned individually about their ability to fairly decide whether or not Trump will become the first former president ever convicted of a crime. The former president is charged with falsifying business records to cover up a sex scandal during his 2016 campaign. At the center of the case are payments totaling $130,000 to adult film star Stormy Daniels. Trump's former lawyer, Michael Cohen, admitted in a plea deal the money was aimed at buying Daniels' silence about the alleged affair that may have taken place more than a decade ago. Donald Trump says he did nothing wrong. I called a, I was, I was paying a lawyer and marked it down as a legal expense, some accountant, I didn't know, marked it down as a legal expense. That's exactly what it was. And you get indicted over that? All right, let's bring in Sherry Bellitz. She is a national jury current, uh, consultant, that is, as well as CEO and president of Sherry Bellitz Communications. Sherry, so good to be with you today. So your thoughts um, on the pace of this jury selection, are you surprised about it? I am not surprised at all. I have seen much lesser cases um, take just as long, if not longer. And Donald Trump is one of the most polarizing characters of the century, and this trial hits all the hot buttons. There's pre-trial publicity, politics, power, money, sex. We are on the cusp of an election, so not surprising in the least. Yeah, and in, in today's uh, proceedings, the judge said that Trump was gesturing and audibly speaking um, in the direction of a potential juror during questioning, adding, quote, I will not have any jurors intimidated in the courtroom. Sherry, how does that kind of behavior, how does that impact potential jurors? Well, you have to put yourself in a juror's position, um, not even as far as the Donald Trump trial, as far as any trial. It's a very intimidating place to be. People do not like to be the center of attention. They do not like to be pulled from their lives, let alone to be at such a high profile trial with someone who is one of the most powerful people in the world. It is extremely intimidating for a number of the jurors, I'm sure. Yeah, and do you think it would make it harder uh, to find jurors for this case? I do think it's going to make it harder. There are quite a number of things that are going to make it really difficult to select a jury in this case, and I wouldn't be surprised if this jury selection takes quite a while. Yeah, and Sherry, talk to us about what these attorneys, uh, what they're looking for when it comes to a juror. Sure. Okay. So you have the Donald Trump team and the Donald Trump team. Manhattan is overwhelmingly anti-Trump. So the Trump team is not looking for supporters. They are looking for impartiality and they are looking for disinterest. People who are not caught up in the news, who are not caught up in the media frenzy, who are independent thinkers, who are independent decision makers, who don't go with the crowd. Perhaps there are some wealthy individuals who may be benefited from Mr. Trump's tax policies and are not so concerned with his social policies or his personal life or really anything outside of that. Um, people who have distrust in the justice system and after COVID, that is quite um, a lot of people. And people who think that this is a politically motivated prosecution, which prosecutors 
are politicians. There is an element of that. As for the prosecution um, and the badgers for the Trump team, that would be liberal, feminist, um, people who have a visceral reaction to Donald Trump, um, people who think that no one is above the law, even a former president. And there are plenty of these people in Manhattan, and people are very polarized when it comes to Donald Trump. Yeah, I'm sure this will take a very long time, the jury selection. We'll see what happens. Sherry, so good to be with you. Thank you for your insights. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. I want former President Donald Trump sits in court. President Joe Biden hits the campaign trail. He begins a three-day sweep through Pennsylvania, one of the swing states that could determine the outcome of the presidential election. President Joe Biden departs the White House on his way to Scranton, Pennsylvania, returning to the community where he was born in 1942. Biden is making Scranton the first stop on his campaign tour this week. And I learned a lot here in Scranton. I learned that money doesn't determine your worth. President Biden focused on taxes, saying former President Trump wants to help the rich while he wants to help the middle class. He learned that paying taxes was something people who work for a living did, not him. He learned that telling people you're fired was something to laugh about. But Make America Great Again, Inc. writes, Bidenomics is failing Pennsylvanians. As the price of everyday necessities continues to soar, Joe Biden's solution to this crisis is to raise taxes on hardworking families. President Trump will cut taxes and unleash American prosperity. The two competing campaigns also offer a stark difference on abortion. Vice President Kamala Harris has held two pro-abortion events in the last four days, traveling to Nevada and Arizona, where the state Supreme Court recently upheld a pro-life law dating back over a century. But for the first time in a very long time, we are seeing a full-on attempt intent to restrict rights, to take rights. SBA Pro-Life America we calls Vice win. President Harris Biden's Biden abortion czar. The, the pro-life group writes, she refuses to name a single limit on abortion she would support. Well, the Supreme Court is raising questions over whether federal prosecutors went too far in bringing obstruction charges against hundreds of participants in the January 6th Capitol riots. It's not immediately clear how the justices would rule in a case that also could impact former President Trump. He is facing the same charge of trying to overturn the results of the 2020 election. The justices heard arguments today in a case involving a former Pennsylvania police officer indicted for taking part in the riots. 330 people face the obstruction charge. Well, the Supreme Court also says that Idaho can enforce its ban on so-called gender-affirming care for minors. The order yesterday allows a 2023 law to go into effect. It subjects doctors to up to 10 years in prison if they provide puberty blockers or care to minors. Lower courts had blocked the bill from taking effect. Well, after months of false starts and setbacks on Capitol Hill, Speaker Mike Johnson unveiled an outline of his plan to move foreign aid through the U.S. House, but it is already getting a lukewarm reception. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales joins us now with more. Eric? Well, good evening, Tracy. Yes, and what's interesting is that lukewarm reception is actually coming from some of Speaker Johnson's fellow Republicans. Now, on paper, the Speaker's plan makes sense. He's decided to hold four separate votes on what is expected to be tens of billions of U.S. tax dollars going to Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan. Now, the fourth bill, it's going to cover secondary issues, security issues, such as a TikTok ban, economic and humanitarian loans to Ukraine, and the Repo Act which would go after Russian oligarch money. But the challenges the speaker now faces are multifaceted. There was a consensus that was, that was um, recognized, in, in my view, from all the opinions that were shared, and that is that it really was the will of my colleagues to vote on these measures independently. But Republican Congressman Bob Good and other Freedom Caucus members are already speaking out, saying securing the border must be included. At least let us have a vote to that effect. We've now been told that uh, the border will not be germane, it will not be uh, applicable, essentially, for... for folks who don't use congressional language, and uh, 
we're not going to be allowed to even vote on it or even to try, and that's a, that's a terrible thing. And they're not alone. If we simply put uh, Remain in Mexico up for a vote again, that would solve 72 percent of the problems. The American people, our constituents, are demanding that we do something about the border. Democrats are going to be key in getting the bills out of the House, but some were surprised that Speaker Johnson will allow amendment votes. Democrats say this wasn't part of the conversation the Speaker had with President Biden on Monday. The idea that we're at this late date and he's still trying to figure it out uh, shows his inability to lead. Um, look, these are serious matters, um, and the situation in Ukraine is particularly serious, uh, and that we're just letting them dangle, um, I think is, uh, quite frankly, just unconscionable. The speaker is also facing new threats to vacate. Congressman Tom Massey has joined Congresswoman Green to force a vote to oust him if he's not willing to step aside. I am not resigning, and it is, um, it is in my view, an absurd notion that someone would bring a vacate motion when we are simply here trying to do our jobs. The speaker says the text of the four separate bills is currently being ironed out right now, and once they get to the floor, the bills will have to pass the rule, which will need some help from Democrat votes, but, uh, and that is rarely used. It's a rarely used tactic. Now, if the plan does fall apart, the speaker will then have to pass the bills with suspension of the rules, which requires a two-thirds majority. And we have to remember that Speaker Johnson has over his head the uh, motion to vacate and also uh, other items of where people are not too happy with the job that he's doing. It's going to be a battle for Speaker Johnson. Tracy? Yeah, no doubt there, Eric. I know a very busy day on the Hill for you. You're also following the impeachment of Alejandro Mayorkas. Uh, tell us what's the latest there. That's right. This, this afternoon, it was around 2 o'clock that the House sent over the articles of impeachment against the Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas to the Senate. We must remember that this is a momentous occasion. Now, this has only happened 60 times in the history of the United States and has only led to 21 impeachments, 19 by trial. It's expected that the majority leader, Chuck Schumer, will actually swear in senators as jurors tomorrow afternoon and is expected to hold a very short trial, one that could wrap up by week's end. But Republicans, on the other hand, they're demanding a full Senate trial and are fighting to drag out this process and shine a light, a spotlight on the failures of this Biden administration at America's borders. At the Capitol, Eric Rosales, EWTN News Nightly. Okay, thank you, Eric. Now we go to the Middle East. The Israeli military displays one of the Iranian ballistic missiles. It says that it intercepted during Saturday night's attack. The IDF says the missiles have more than 1,000 pounds of explosives. Officials also say that they will not be deterred in responding to the strike. Tehran is also weighing in, saying any retaliation will be met with a response from Iran in a matter of seconds not ours. Uh, one of Denmark's oldest buildings has gone up in flames. The blaze raged through the 17th century Copenhagen Stock Exchange, causing severe damage. The fire started on the roof during renovations, but police say it is too early to say what caused the accident. Many people, some on their way to work, stopped to try and save art treasures and iconic images. All right, now to Maryland, where officials announced a salvage team recovered another body from the Baltimore Bridge collapse. Late last month, a cargo ship crashed into the Francis Scott Key Bridge, causing it to almost completely collapse. The victim's identity has not been released at the request of his family. Authorities are still searching for the two missing bodies that remain unaccounted for. Well, we have a lot more still to come here on EWTN News Nightly, including a move that surprised absolutely no one. Catholic basketball sensation Caitlin Clark went first overall in the 2024 WNBA draft. But what may surprise you is what her high school basketball coach said about Clark's God-given talents. That interview coming up. And what a politician in Hungary is doing to help persecuted Christians. The commission is recommending that abortion in Germany should be legal during the first 12 weeks. Currently, abortion is illegal in Germany, but it is not punishable if a woman undergoes counseling and a three-day wait period. The commission's recommendation is not binding, but it is likely to heat up over the debate 
over abortion. A police in Australia say a knife attack against an Orthodox bishop and priest is being treated as terrorism. Police arrested a 16-year-old suspect after the stabbing during a service at Christ the Good Shepherd Church. Both the bishop and priest are expected to survive. Officials in New South Wales say the suspect's comments point to a religious motive. While Christians face persecution in many parts of the world, in Hungary, an initiative that began in 2016 is seeking to protect the faithful. EW10 Vatican Bureau Chief Andreas Tonhauser met with a lawmaker from Hungary who was part of that project. Could you tell us a little bit more about what the tasks are of your Secretary of State? First of all, Hungary has a Christian democratic uh, government, and we are the, uh, one of the very few remaining European nations who are proud about our Christian cultural heritage and about our Christian uh, faith. So it only came natural that we started to recognize the extent and severity of uh, Christian persecution in the world. The program was started when uh, we have witnessed the atrocities uh, what uh, ISIS have uh, committed against Christians in Iraq and uh, Syria. And then we started to survey uh, the situation. And working together with faith-based uh, charities, we have uh, uh, found uh, something that uh, has uh, shaken what we have thought about our age and our world um, uh, today. And that finding, that conclusion was that in today, Christianity is the most persecuted religious uh, group in the world. According to different organizations, there are more than 300 million followers of Christ in the world who are either discriminated because they are Christian. So what brings you to Rome? I came here for two reasons. Uh, to meet uh, high-ranking uh, officials of the Holy See and also of the uh, Italian uh, government. With the Holy See and with the Catholic Church, we have been uh, cooperating ever since we have started our mission for persecuted uh, Christians. It only comes natural. Our program and our approach is uh, ecumenical. We work for the persecuted Catholics, Orthodox, and Protestants. But because of sharing the same uh, mission with the Catholic Church, we have been in uh, cooperation uh, from Mauritania in West Africa to the uh, Philippines, from Pakistan to um, Mozambique. So ever since we have started Hungary Helps uh, program, we very closely work together with the, the uh, Holy See. This brings me to my next question. Hungary is, of course, also a member of the European Union. Are there many other than Italy? Are there, what, what about the other members? Are they joining you in this very important work also to, to stand up for the persecuted? There were some uh, governments who, who declined any sort of um, uh, partnership. I'm not going to point fingers. That's not the point of this um, interview. But sometimes uh, we have seen a very uh, strong uh, denial. Uh, sometimes we have seen in diplomatic arenas, even in uh, Brussels um, uh, meetings, that when we make a case for the more than 4,000 Christians in Nigeria who are murdered by jihadists. They claim that it has nothing to do with the religion, but it is in some way an after effect of um, uh, climate change. So there is an ignorance and there is a, a, a building of, uh, um, they have built a wall of uh, indifference around this uh, fact that that is something uh, hard hard uh, to break uh, this uh, wall. But we are, we are hopeful, we are uh, persistent, and I'm very optimistic about our cooperation with the uh, Italian government, which would be a new um, um, cooperation. Mr. Arspace, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for this interview. Thanks for the opportunity. Up next on EWTN News Nightly, a gift for baskets. Learn more about a Catholic high school graduate, Caitlin Clark, following her big night at the WNBA draft. Plus, ahead of this summer's Olympic Games in Paris, the festivities begin with an ancient tradition in Greece.
Virginia, a federal appeals court has overturned a ban on biological boys playing in girls' sports. In a two-to-one ruling, the court said the measure violates Title IX, the civil rights law that prohibits sex-based discrimination in schools. It is not immediately clear if West Virginia will appeal the ruling. Uh, Caitlin Clark, a graduate of a Catholic high school in Iowa, was the number one overall pick in last night's women's professional basketball draft. <laughs> The former star at the University of Iowa became a household name of basketball fans during her record-breaking college career. Clark said after the draft last night that she had been dreaming of the moment since she was in second grade. And we turn now to someone who has known Caitlin Clark for many years, her former coach at Dowling Catholic High School in Des Moines, Iowa, Kristen Meyer. Kristen, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, so when you were coaching Caitlin in high school, did you ever think that she would be this accomplished in her basketball career? And what's it been like for you uh, to see her set records in college and appear on TV and commercials? And of course, now as the number one draft pick in the WNBA. You know, I always expected her to be successful in college. She is a tremendous basketball player, and we saw that throughout her high school years. So I'm not all surprised, to, all that surprised to see the success that she's had. And, you know, she scores a lot. She helps her team win. Uh, but the fame and the notoriety is something that I would have never predicted. And what kind of impact um, has she had on the community? I, I know recently that many people uh, from Downley Catholic said that they would attend the games at the University of Iowa. What's it mean to them to see her in this position? Oh, I think people across the country just love watching her play, and obviously people in Iowa and here around Dowling Catholic and West Des Moines, you know, we have a, a little special connection. So, um, you know, we've probably been watching a little bit closer, supporting her a little bit more and a little bit longer than a lot of people. But we're just so proud of her accomplishments, but also how she carries herself as a person. She's a great leader, a great teammate, and she's really making a positive impact on not just the sports world, but I think the world in general. Yeah, and you can tell that just by watching her, her demeanor. She seems very humble as well. Tell us a little bit more about her and maybe her family and how important their Catholic faith is to them. Yeah, well, the main reason she came to Dowling Catholic High School is because of the faith component. And Caitlin's mom, Ann, uh, who is Ann Nizzi, she went to Dowling Catholic along with Caitlin's aunts and uncles on her mom's side. And her grandpa, Nizzi, Bob Nizzi, was a football coach uh, and a teacher, or he might have been a counselor here at Dowling Catholic for a number of years. And so the main reason that her family, you know, was involved in Dowling Catholic was because of the faith component. Um, and so Caitlin was always going to go to Dowling Catholic and, and really enjoyed her, her four years here. Yeah, so beautiful. And as we mentioned, uh, Caitlin said last night that she had dreamed uh, of this moment since she was in second grade. Um, did you know that she wanted to play professional basketball? You know, she didn't really talk about it a lot, but uh, her skill set definitely made me think that it was possible. And she's always been one who's kind of focused on the, the here and now. So I think she had those long-term goals, but she just wanted to every day maximize her potential and her time and her efforts. And so she just focused on getting better every single day. And, and some of the opportunities then that have come is because she's really just focused on the here and now. Yeah, and, and as a high school coach, for those maybe young ladies um, out there, athletes who have possibly the same dream as Caitlin, um, anything that you could offer them as far as advice? Yeah, I think work for what you want to accomplish. You know, earn the right to be successful is, is the main thing. Uh, surround yourself with people who will help you reach those goals. And Caitlin talks a, a lot about the confidence that she has in herself. That's an earned confidence. So I think if you really want to excel in, in whether it's sports or music or drama or, or anything, put in the work to earn the right to be confident and then go give it your best shot. And uh, before I let you go, I just quickly want to ask you this. Um, Caitlin seems very bold in her faith. Can you talk to us about how, even with the other athletes that you coach, how important is it to have that connection? Yeah, obviously we're a little bit lucky at Dallin Catholic to get to talk about our faith and, you know, go to the chapel and, and attend mass. Uh, so it's a little bit easier to do. But I think Caitlin is a type of person who it's always been important for her to maximize her God-given talents. 
and to share those with the world. She knows that that her, her some of her gifts from God are not only her athleticism, but her ability to entertain. And so I think she really just tries to maximize those gifts and share those with the world through the sport of basketball. Yeah, and it's so wonderful to see. Kristen, thank you so much for your time today. We appreciate it. God bless you. Thank you so much. Well, it is the first step on a 3,000 mile journey to the Paris Olympics. In a ceremony full of ancient traditions, the Olympic torch was lit at the birthplace of the Games in Greece. 600 people will carry it over the next three weeks. It is expected to arrive in France before the Games opening ceremony in Paris on July 26th. Now we thank you for watching tonight. Remember, you can follow us on social media, Facebook X and Instagram at EWTN News Nightly. I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.